Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Nirav Shah, and I am the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control within the Maine Department of Health and Human Services. I'd like to provide an update on the state's efforts regarding the coronavirus or COVID-19 situation. I'd like to do a couple of things today. The first is to talk about the nature of testing that is currently underway at the Maine CDC laboratory just around the corner. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about the process under which testing is occurring. Uh, and then third, provide a flavor of what Maine CDC's goals are right now, what the nature of our activities are, and what we foresee coming in the near future. And then finally, talk a little bit about prevention and steps that everybody in Maine can and should be taking right now to keep safe. Let's start with testing. Maine CDC laboratory here in Augusta is offering testing for the novel coronavirus, the virus that is known to cause a disease that has now been labeled COVID-19. The laboratory has an estimated throughput of anywhere from one to 200 tests per day, a very high number that at present exceeds the available demand, uh, exceeds the demand that has been asked for by providers across the state thus far. Depending on what we see with respect to the number of tests that are requested by providers, we have the ability to continue to increase that, increase that throughput depending on the number of tests that are requested. At present, samples are returned and results are given back to providers within 48 hours of the test being requested, which is in line with other state laboratories right now. Samples that test positive at the main CDC laboratory for COVID-19 are labeled as presumptive positives. That's because according to the US CDC, any lab that, de that determines that a, a sample is presumptively positive must send that specimen to the US CDC's laboratory in Atlanta for final confirmation. Only the US CDC's laboratory can label a test as actually positive. And that's why when Maine may have a case, which is something we're preparing for, the samples will be listed on our website as presumptively positive, awaiting confirmation at the US CDC. As I mentioned, the state laboratory has the capacity to conduct anywhere from one to 200 sample specimen runs per day. That's a higher number than other state laboratories. But again, depending on how the demand for coronavirus testing evolves, we will index the amount of testing that we offer to ensure that that demand is being met. To date, the capacity at the Maine CDC laboratory far exceeds the demand that has occurred thus far in the state of Maine. Under the latest US CDC testing criteria, medical providers determine who can and should be tested for COVID-19. They do that on the basis of a number of factors. Some of them are, some of them are clinical, that is to say, whether a patient has the signs and symptoms of coronavirus disease, those include shortness of breath, cough, fever, chest pain. They also, providers also take into account epidemiological factors. That is to say, with whom any individual case has come into contact with, the degree of that exposure, as well as any particular patient's underlying medical conditions. To date, as I've mentioned, the capacity for testing at the Maine CDC laboratory has exceeded the demand for that testing. I'd like to provide a little bit more detail on how individuals can specifically obtain testing uh, for, for coronavirus. As it stands right now, according to the United States Center for Disease Control Guidelines, clinicians have the discretion to determine who in their practice should be offered a test for coronavirus. I mentioned a moment ago some of the factors that clinicians use for that. They look at a patient's clinical symptoms. They also look at some of the epidemiological and exposure profiles that any patient has had. If a provider feels that a particular patient warrants testing for COVID-19, they call the, the main CDC if they need to, to chat with one of our epidemiologists to make sure that this patient does in fact meet the current parameters and criteria for testing. If no phone call is necessary, the provider can log onto our website, download the respective acquisition forms. Those, those forms have explicit instructions on how a sample can and should be taken on that patient. Uh, 
The provider takes that sample. Most usually the sample includes either a nasal swab or a throat swab, or in some cases both. The provider takes that sample, packages it appropriately, and sends it via courier to our laboratory here in Augusta. As I mentioned earlier, those samples are returned usually within 48 hours after the, sample, after the test has been requested, and that's very much in line with other state laboratories. If a sample tests positive or negative, regardless of what the sample is, our laboratory immediately notifies the provider. If a sample is positive, the protocol will be that the infection control practitioner at the institution may also be notified so that proper and prompt infection control practices can be implemented. A few notes uh, in terms of our numbers. There are currently no confirmed cases of COVID-19 disease in Maine. If we receive a positive result, we will issue a press release. I say that because in the past several days, we have received inquiries about reported positive cases, and I'm here to let everybody know that from a communication standpoint, we will, we will quickly issue a press release to, to inform the public about what we've learned and the nature of that case as soon as we are able to. Right now, because Maine does not have any confirmed positive cases of coronavirus disease, we have a window of opportunity to maximize our preparedness. Yesterday, the Maine CDC issued an alert to healthcare providers, institutions, and long-term care facilities across the state to begin their preparations for the possibility of community transmission of coronavirus disease. What I mean by that is that given the fact that in the Pacific Northwest, there is already sustained person-to-person -person transmission we should take a moment to learn from what has happened there and take the opportunity, given that there are not yet cases in Maine, to maximize our opportunities for preparedness. We ask providers and institutions to start assessing their systems, to start taking, make, taking steps that, to make sure that they have educated their staff on coronavirus disease, and start planning and preparing for the possibility that their institution may soon be caring for patients with coronavirus disease in Maine. Again, our goal right now is to maximize our opportunity for preparedness, given that we do not have current cases in Maine right now. It's also an opportunity for Maine people to maximize their own preparedness right now. And toward that end, I'd have three requests for everyone in Maine. The first is to stay healthy. Do all of the things right now that you would otherwise be doing to stay healthy. Eat a good diet, get sleep, exercise, and if you haven't gotten your flu shot, please do so, it is not too late. The second thing I would ask everyone to do is to take care not to spread any illness to others. That includes things that we've heard about recently, like making sure you're not coughing into a large room, but rather coughing into your elbow. If appropriate, depending on your own profile, maybe you avoid shaking hands. According to the US CDC, now is the time for elderly folks as well as individuals with chronic medical conditions to take stock of their day-to-day -day activities and determine where they might need to cut back depending on the possibility of community transmission. The third thing I ask everyone in Maine to do is to stay informed. We're in a situation right now where fear and misinformation can and may spread far more quickly than this virus. We ask everyone to trust and check reputable sources of information, such as the Maine CDC's website, as well as that of the US CDC, to stay informed on the latest with respect to coronavirus so that everyone in, can, everyone in Maine can make the best decisions for themselves and their family right now. Prevention is key. And given that we now have a window of opportunity to maximize our preparedness, we're asking everyone in Maine, healthcare providers, institutions, and Maine people alike, to maximize that chance right now. Thank you all very much. I'm happy to take some questions. I spoke to a big a few days ago. They said that they hadn't received any guidance from the CDC. Is that something that you can address now? Uh, we have offered guidance via the Office of Child and Family Services. It, the guidance is also on our website with respect to what daycare centers can and should be doing right now. 
The, da the guidance is very similar to what schools were also provided, which is to say evaluating who is coming into their institution, what signs and symptoms they may look out for, and starting to think now about what changes might be made to schedules in the event that community transmission becomes a possibility in Maine. That guidance is very much available on, on our website as well as that of the US CDC. Have you gotten any feedback as far as from the US CDC lab on when you're going to get those test results? So we have, we have received all of the test results from the US CDC. They have all been negative. All of the tests that providers request in Maine right now are being done at our laboratory. What about the advanced age of a lot of the population in Maine? Are we at particular risk here? It's a concern. It's definitely a concern of ours. One of the reasons that my team and I started preparing for the possibility of coronavirus disease quite a long time ago is that any infectious disease, especially respiratory infectious diseases, whether that's influenza, other viruses, and now what we know about coronavirus, have a disproportionate effect on two groups of people, the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. We knew that was a possibility in Maine. That's one reason we began preparing early. One of, um, actually just 12 minutes ago, uh, some of the members of my team wrapped up a, 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 the latest in a series of briefings that we have been doing with and for long-term care providers in Maine because not only are the elderly in general higher at risk, we're especially concerned about long-term care providers. The guidance that I referred to earlier that Maine CDC put out yesterday has a specific section specifically for long-term care providers and the steps that they should be taking now while we have this window of opportunity to maximize our preparedness. Um, given that we've only seen 20 test results come back so far, is there any reason to think there might be community spread that hasn't been detected yet? It's, it's a possibility. Based on what we know right now, there are a number of factors we look at. We look at not just the number of results, but we also look to see if there are higher than average numbers of influenza-like illness compared to prior years. Um, our influenza reports continue to be posted on our website on a every Tuesday basis. Based on what we've seen right now, we are tracking with prior years, but it's impossible to know. What we can know for sure is that testing is widespread and available in Maine, and we have been briefing providers since January on asking about the signs and symptoms and potential risk factors for COVID-19 disease. Uh, community transmission is certainly a risk, given that it's occurring in a widespread basis in the Pacific Northwest. That's why we are preparing for that possibility here. Dr. Now, you haven't not. addressed where people should go to get this, these testing. I mean, I've heard some emergency room docs that they're getting flooded, and that's not where you want them to go. That's right. So we have, we have two pieces of recommendation for that. The first is that if, if an individual is at home and they're not feeling well, before they go to any healthcare institution, be that an emergency room, urgent care, or their own doctor's office, they call the doctor's office first. What we don't want happening is for coronavirus to go from being travel associated, which it largely is right now, to being hospital associated. And that can happen when folks go to the emergency room. So our first piece of request, our first request is that everyone call their healthcare provider. Our second piece of, or our second request is that uh, where folks should go depends on the nature of their health care. For a lot of folks, the easiest thing to do is to go to their primary care physician. Primary care physicians can and have been submitting tests to us. For other folks, uh, urgent care may be the best option. Tests are available from health care providers across the state of Maine, and we've been working not just with physicians, but hospitals as institutions so that they know how to intake those patients and get the tests ran and run in an appropriate fashion. But our big piece of advice is to ask folks to call their health care provider before they show up. What about yes, the guidance for uh, like the home care services, things like that? Because that looks a little bit different for a lot of people. Yes, home care and caregivers in general. Also, uh, the, the, so I'll say two things. Let me, let me say this first. Even though this is a new virus, the nature of the public health response is not brand new. Indeed, the US CDC is utilizing a 2017 pandemic preparedness plan. The same thing applies at the state level. When I talk to my counterparts in the other 50, 49 states, which I do on almost a nightly basis, we're basing a lot of our recommendations on what, what has already been done for other respiratory viruses that we, that we grapple with, with specific, with specific reference to home health providers. The same analysis applies. 
the things that they can and should be doing this time of year to protect against influenza among their staff, as well as to guard against transmission when they're in the home, also apply for coronavirus. Um, US CDC is working on guidance, having already produced guidance for hospitals, long-term care facilities, child care centers. They're now working on guidance for other sectors of the healthcare institution. But our advice to those groups, indeed even on a webinar yesterday at one o'clock, this exact question came up. And my advice there was you need not wait for official guidance from the US CDC. What my counterparts and I have been saying is that the existing things that you would otherwise do to prevent infections cross apply here. Yes, sir. Can you tell us, well, first of all, how many uh, samples have the state lab processed? And secondly, can you tell us anything about the folks who have been tested in terms of, you know, is there any commonality among their ages or, you know, what percentage, you know, had foreign travel versus, you know, may have had contact with someone who tested positive or any regions of the state where Great. folks are from, are they concentrated southern Maine, northern east, anything like that? Sure. Um, our state, well, let, me, let me start at the top with the numbers. There have been 20 negative tests thus far. 10 of those results have been returned from the US federal CDC lab. The other 10 negative results have been conducted our, at our laboratory just in the past 96 hours. Um, now with respect to what we can learn about those 20 individuals, it's actually, um, it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a broad mix. One of those individuals uh, is an individual who was notified to us as having returned from a country of travel, um, and, and that's an individual that we publicly reported on back in February. That individual tested negative on February 13th. The other 19 individuals uh, are, are a smattering. Some are individuals who have returned from travel to affected parts of the world. Some have included South Korea and Italy. Others are close contacts of, of suspected, I'm sorry, close contacts of known cases and, and folks who have developed symptoms. So it really is a pretty broad array. Um, given that it's really just 20 cases, we haven't done any robust epidemiological analysis. You really need bigger numbers before you can detect trends amongst 20 people. So it's, it's something that, of course, we're taking a look at. But right now, given that it's just 20, it's premature to draw any larger scale epidemiological conclusions. Did all the 20 present symptoms? Yes. So right now, according to the US CDC, uh, the one criteria that is necessary for testing is that you are symptomatic. That is, th there's a very specific scientific reason for that, which is that if you were to run the test in someone who is not showing symptoms, we don't know if they're not, if, if the test were to come back negative, we would not know whether it's actually negative, meaning they don't have any virus in their body, or if the virus just hasn't multiplied enough to be at a level that's detectable. And for that reason, as a scientific matter, the US CDC strongly requests, requires, that individuals who be tested have symptoms. That way we have greater fidelity in the result that we get back from the test. How many tests are outstanding? As of this very minute, five. But let me be very clear, there is no backlog right now. We have the capacity to do one to 200 tests per day. As of this very minute, it is five. By the time we're done here, it might be two. It, the throughput, again, when you can do 200 a day, um, when, you, when you're able to, you know, a couple or something that can be run pretty quickly. But uh, it's at this very second, as we were walking in, we confirmed the number and it's five at this very minute. Uh, that will change over the next couple of hours and certainly change by noon tomorrow. Yes, sir. And in terms of, uh do you have like a rough percentage, like um, the number of people who returned from a country versus those who had contact? Is it like 50-50? And then uh, secondly, I got another one I'm gonna do for Yeah, time. yeah. Um, are there any other labs in Maine doing testing or is it just the state lab? Are there commercial labs, university labs? Um, let, let, me do, let me answer the first one. We don't have a, a strict breakdown quite yet. Uh, and that's, I mean, we, that, that's largely because with such small numbers, it's just difficult to draw any conclusions. In other states, in, in talking with my counterparts about this, in other states that have put those data on their website, um, they're waiting, they've been waiting or, you know, to do real scientific analysis, you're looking something at the order of hundreds of tests to draw any real viable, usable conclusions. We, when we get to that number, rest assured we will do that. And if we get to a point where we're seeing the same things with cases, 
we will do the same thing, which is what other states, namely Washington, is starting to do on their website. Uh, with respect to other laboratories, uh, there is one other commercial, or there is one other laboratory in Maine that is bringing on a test. We had a call with them yesterday to understand and plan for how they will report positives to us so that we can undertake the epidemiological part of our investigation. And so I, I can't stay more than that because I want to let them talk about what they're doing, but there is another laboratory right now that will soon be coming online. I, I'd prefer not to, just because I don't want to go into what they're, what they're up to. But th that piece that I mentioned is really critical because we know, according to recent decisions by the US FDA, additional laboratories across the country can and will be coming online. In fact, sir, to your question, you asked specifically about laboratories in Maine, but there are also national reference laboratories that can and will be offering the test. These are ent entities like Quest and LabCorp that you may have heard of. We have already been working with them because again, a critical piece for the public health system is although we want to do as many tests as possible and we welcome that, we need to know when someone tests positive so we can immediately reach out to them and touch base with their family members and determine where they've been in the past two weeks. That's, what's the, that's what our gumshoe epidemiologists, our disease detectives do on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've been coordinating with those national entities as well as another entity in Maine so that when tests are brought on, our epidemiologists as well as our IT systems are ready to incorporate the results and spring into action to act on positives. Would there ever be a point where someone from one of the areas in the U.S. affected by this, like Boston or Washington State, we say, please don't come here to Maine because we have fewer cases. We're trying to... I, I can't comment on any, any hypotheticals or I can't speculate on what we would do. What I can tell you is that we are in very close contact, especially within New England. Uh, several times per week, my colleagues and I in here in New England are on the phone uh, weekends, nights, holidays included, to talk about what each and every one of us is seeing. Certainly in the past 96 hours, uh, with respect to the increase in cases in Massachusetts, many of which are associated with a conference that occurred there from February 24th through February 27th, the pace of those calls has increased. So we are very much keeping tabs on what other states in New England are seeing. As you may be aware, there are now four cases in New Hampshire, uh, an increasing number of cases across New England. So we're very much keeping tabs on those situations, but as to what potential actions we can, might take in the future, I can't speculate. Uh, I'm gonna go on this side. Yes, sir, or ma'am. Uh, given the state is relying on referrals, are there any special protocols in place to prevent potential transmission from infected people's healthcare workers? C could you uh, tell me what you mean by relying on referrals? Well, Great. Um, and then the second part of your question again? Um, are there any particular protocols in place to prevent potential transmission from infected people to healthcare workers as we've seen? Good, before? good. Let me, let me comment on the first piece, which is that uh, the guidance that we are following is per the United States Center for Disease Control. Uh, we are following what they have required or strongly recommended states to do. And that is to say, to work with providers to make sure providers are the ones who are the who are the ones, the arbiters of who should be tested. We are not standing in the way of any physician and their patient. If a provider thinks someone should be tested, our laboratory is able to offer that. Now, with respect to the second half of the question, yes, very early on, as I mentioned, one of our, one of our key goals was to try to ensure that COVID-19 did not go from being travel associated to hospital associated. That involves trying to, to, to reduce two modes of transmission. The first is from a patient with COVID-19 affecting a healthcare worker, and then the other is the opposite, which is a healthcare worker potentially infecting a patient. One of the very first groups that we met with and offered guidance to were, health, were, were critical care, acute care hospitals, because this is where that type of transmission can be the most prevalent. What we have done since day one is focus on what I call the three eyes in this respect. The first is identification, rapid case identification. That involves making sure doctors know to ask about travel and then also trying to get tests at the time to the US CDC, now to our laboratory. That's the first eye. The second eye is isolation. And that's really the piece that is critical to your question. Rapid and prompt isolation of patients 
who have been suspected of having COVID-19 is the key to preventing facility or hospital associated transmission. That was one of the things that we briefed hospitals on very early on, is making sure that if a patient is suspected of having COVID-19, they are placed in an isolation room, a mask is placed on them, and that any healthcare provider who interacts with them has the appropriate gown, gloves, and mask on, what's called PPE. We actually very early on hosted a large webinar specifically for hospital infection control staff to make sure that they were boned up on the latest guidance there. And then the third eye is investigation. First is identification, second is isolation, and the third is investigation. We talked about that a moment ago. This is the work that our gumshoe epidemiologists, our disease detectives do. Once we have an individual who's suspected of having a case, they spring into action, get in touch with them, get in touch with their family, and determine everywhere they've been, and then we have concentric rings that go outward to try to identify everyone that they might have been in touch with. Uh, doctor, there's yes, concerns Mel. in parts of the country about Thank supplies. You. Thanks, Jackie. Yes. Things like the, the gowns you were just talking about, masks, et cetera. How are we doing in Maine? Are we in a good position, or are you worried? It's a concern. Uh, as you noted, the, the, the availability of supplies as it's called PPE or personal protective equipment, has been a challenge not just in Maine but across the country. Uh, in frequent calls and meetings with my counterparts across the other 49 states, uh, we know that that is a challenge. What we have been doing is a few things. The first is very early on, we took stock of what our supplies were here in Maine at our, at, within the Maine CDC. We also asked providers of all stripes across the state of Maine to take stock of what they had in hand. The second thing we did, excuse me, was to ask providers, institutions, facilities to make sure that they were using PPE when it was appropriate. There's often a situation here when providers can overutilize the PPE that needs to be used. So we offered them briefings as part of the same webinar series that I mentioned earlier to infection control providers and doctors to remind them of exactly what the PPE requirements were so that we could conserve this resource. The third thing that we are doing is recognizing that facilities across the state will need assistance with PPE, offering them guidance on how they can do that. There are healthcare coalitions across the state of Maine that can coordinate the transfer of PPE across members of the coalition. There are also different suppliers that do have and stock PPE from time to time. If and when it becomes necessary, the Maine CDC is also prepared to work with providers to top off their supplies of PPE, and we'll do so through a, a scientific process. It won't be an ad hoc distribution. We are very, very concerned about this situation. It's one that we actually, I, I'm not exaggerating, we have an entire team within the main CDC whose full-time job it is to, is to keep tabs on PPE and work with provider groups to make sure that those supplies are adequate. What coordination do you have with NEMA? since they obviously have military supplies that fit this same description. Extensive. One of the very first phone calls that I made back in late December or early January was to Acting Director Pete Rogers at MEMA to brief him on what we at the time were just seeing in China. It hadn't even really spread beyond China, but because of work that I've done previously here in, in Maine on another situation, Director Rogers and I had worked together and. Uh, I, I knew the importance of having a robust collaboration with MEMA. So they have been attending our situational briefings and our meetings from day one. They're very well in the loop on where things are. If and when we need to expand the nature of the state's activation, MEMA is standing right next to us. Dr. Uh, Shug, uh, given yeah. that the spring break uh, is, is coming up and people, um, regardless of, of recommendations, are going to be traveling, um, can you talk about recommendations for them to stay safe and then also how the state is going to monitor people who Good. are coming back from traveling to some places. Our recommendation for individuals who are traveling, be it for spring break or for any other holiday, is to do two things first. The first is check the US CDC and the US State Department's websites. If you are contemplating travel to a country or a part of the world that has been labeled as a level three, which is to say avoid non-essential travel, we ask that you heed that recommendation. The individuals who create those recommendations are acutely and keenly aware of the situation on the ground. They take making those recommendations very seriously. And so if you are contemplating travel, 
to one of the countries that have been labeled as a level three, we strongly ask that you reconsider. Those are countries such as Italy, South Korea, and others. Um, to the extent that travel to other parts of the world are going to be going on, uh, I ask that you do a few things. The first is stay healthy. Situation, again, hypothetically speaking, where we're not looking at 1,000 cases in a month, but 1,000 cases over three to six months. That presents a different type of challenge for a healthcare system. So as we've shifted our operational goal away from, again, a rapid outbreak to sustained community transmission, a gradual pressurization of the healthcare system, the questions we ask are a bit different. We ask questions not so much on how many beds do you have, but how quickly can, can patients be moved into the hospital and out of the hospital. We ask not how many respirators do you have, although we still ask that. We also ask, are there uh, elective surgeries that could potentially be postponed in order to free up more space for a medium time? So those are the kinds of questions that we're thinking about. It is a concern, it's a risk, uh, and it's something that we've been talking about with hospitals early on in the setting of an outbreak, and now as we talk about this gradual pressurization. With blood drives being scheduled constantly, is there any concern that there is any possible transmission through that process? It's a great question. Uh, it actually came up uh, about 24 hours ago on a, on a call that state health officials had with the US CDC. So I am, I am pleased to report that according to the US CDC, there is no evidence that blood draw, uh, blood draw events or the blood supply is at risk from coronavirus. For the, in the interest of disclosure, there is a concern, depending on how big that blood draw was, that there could be a large gathering of folks. And if a blood draw were scheduled for thousands of people in the Pacific Northwest right now, there might be a recommendation to scale back on that or to disperse it over a larger area. But your question is specifically about the safety and the sanctity of the blood supply itself. According to the US CDC, that is not a risk right now. Is there any way for, for blood to contain that virus? Based on what we know right now, it has not been detected. There is scientific research ongoing to try to characterize that. What I can tell you right now is that the, the vast majority of the scientific research that has been conducted shows and suggests that the virus resides in the lungs and in the respiratory passages. That's why when we talk about how it's transmitted, we talk about protecting your cough, trying to avoid sneezing into somebody's face, things like that, because the virus comes from deep within the lungs and accelerates out of the lungs, and it can be inhaled or put on the face of somebody else. That's also why we recommend touching your face, not touching your face. Something I've been trying to do throughout this briefing is not touch my face. We'll see in the video if I was actually successful at that. But that's why we talk about things like avoiding touching your face, avoiding coughing into people's faces, things like that. Dr. Shaw, yes. uh, I think we've talked about this before, but probably bears worth repeating. Uh, why is it that health officials are concerned about this to this degree? People keep asking, you know, so many more people die of the flu on an annual basis, but why are you underscoring a lot of this stuff? When we talk about new diseases, we think about three things. Or when we talk about any disease, we think about three things. One. How much immunity is there in the population to that disease? On that respect, this new coronavirus scores really poorly or really well, depending on whose perspective you're looking at. There, because it is a novel virus, there is no immunity in the population to it. Number two, we look at how quickly it can be spread, what we call transmissibility, how easy it is, like we were talking about a moment ago, to be spread from person to person. There, the novel coronavirus is concerning. It seems to be able to spread more quickly than the flu, which is already a concerning disease. The third thing we look at is how lethal it is. And there again, the novel coronavirus is concerning. Based on what we know right now, the case fatality rate is approximately 1%. Some studies put it higher, some studies put it lower, based on what population we're talking about. But by comparison, the fatality rate for the flu is on the order of 0.1 to 0.2 percent. So we're talking about something that, based on which data sets you're comparing, could be anywhere from five to 10 times more deadly than the flu. So when you put those two, three things together, it's a virus that no one has immunity to, that can spread very quickly, and sadly cause a high number of fatalities, we're left with something that the public health system should be taking seriously. That's why we at the Maine CDC, as soon as I saw this coming across my desk, back in mid-December, given the experience that I had working on SARS 18 years ago, we started working on this. Why was Maine 
So it's, uh, wait, I just want to make. The testing lab. Good. So um, there's a couple of things going on that I think are both independent but related. The first is um, the, when the US CDC rolled out its testing kits, they gave priority for states that were more severely affected, Washington, California, et cetera. Even now, on a call yesterday, the same one that I mentioned, US CDC indicated that when it comes time to ordering more kits, they will continue to give priority to states that have more cases, Washington, New York, et cetera. That is the nature of doling out a scarce resource. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that we also needed to purchase a new piece of equipment. There's a process in place to purchase that piece of equipment. The minute that the US CDC released the guidance on how the test should be conducted and what equipment was necessary, the minute that came out, my lab team called us, called, us, uh, called me, and said, we need to buy a new piece of equipment. We need to start that immediately. That day, we started the administrative process to purchase that. It involves going to the legislature to get their okay to do so, which we received on February 25th. That day or the next day, we ordered the machine. The machine took six days to come here because the manufacturer, Kyogen, has a lot of other orders from other states. The machine also has to be properly installed and calibrated by representatives from the company. That process took a few days. Then after the machine is properly installed and calibrated, we have to undergo what's called proficiency testing. That process also took a while. So six days after we ordered the machine, it arrived. Six days after the machine arrived, we were online. That's just a peek into the process. What I want to be really clear about, though, is that at no time in the state of Maine was an individual's lab testing delayed. Indeed, up until a few days ago, as I mentioned earlier, there was just one person in the state of Maine who needed to be tested. That was the individual on February 13th. So at no time in the past, since the test was released by the US CDC, not for a single second, at any point in the state of Maine, has anybody had to wait for testing. Those tests were collected and sent to Atlanta for analysis. What's the name of that machine? How much did that cost? It is called a Kyogen, Q-I-A-G-E-N, extractor platform. What it does is that when a, when a spe, and it, it costs approximately $58,000. Um, it's not just for coronavirus. I want to be clear. We will also be able to utilize it for other testing. It replaced a machine that had not been updated since 2007. So we inherited a, we, we inherited a machine that had not been replaced in a number of years. It needed replacing. There's an administrative process for that. That's the process we had to follow. What the machine does is to, uh, when, when we get a specimen on a swab, you have to go from taking that specimen, which contains nasal fluid on it, you have to go from that to being able to isolate a piece of that fluid to determine whether there is a virus in it. By isolate, what I really mean is extract. So this platform allows you to go from a specimen of bodily fluid and extract it and extract the biological particles on it to make it suitable for the DNA test that we have to run. That's a necessary piece of the machine. The machine that it replaced was woefully out of date. It, bared, it, it needed to be updated, and that's what we did. Given, I don't know if it's too early for you to start planning about this, but because we do get a bunch of cruise ships here, and that has been a focus of this, what's the plan on that? Great right. question. Um, I talked earlier on about sort of the things that we started tackling at the very beginning, acute care hospitals. We haven't talked about EMS, but that was the other thing that we focused on long-term care facilities. Once we got those folks where they needed to be and prepped them and reminded them of the infection control practices, got them the guidance, one of the things we started turning our attention to was cruise ships. That came into sharper focus when the Diamond Princess off the coast of Japan uh, be became a, a concern. Uh, so a couple of notes on cruise ships. The first is that Maine is not alone in being a state that welcomes cruise ships. So my counterparts from other cruise ship states we formed a bit of a working group that meets from time to time to discuss what each of us is doing on a respective basis about that. The federal government also has a significant role to play. Just this morning, we met with officials from the Coast Guard to talk, about, to talk with them about how they are approaching this situation and how they're thinking about it, what, what the resources they would bring to bear on this situation is. We're also planning a larger scale meeting to be held very soon 
to think about what scenarios under which, what, what the various respective scenarios that could occur are and what our responses would be. As you can imagine, it's a challenging situation. What I can say is that we are studying very closely what happened with the Diamond Princess, what's cur currently undergoing with the Grand Princess, and what is brewing off the coast of Florida right now to try to make sure we learn from each and every one of those situations. What we thought we knew about quarantine four or 500 years ago is not the way we approach things now. So our goal is to come up with a better way to manage these situations. We're working in close partnership with other states, Florida, Texas, California, Alaska, as well as with the federal government, Coast Guard, DOT, et cetera. So, can you yeah. talk about how, how someone comes on to get tested yep. and, and how the clinicians can make that uh, determination? But with this low number of tests, is there, uh, is there any number that you would expect to come out of a state like Maine? Is there any time you'd look at the number of tests and say, maybe we're missing something? Yeah, so let me, it's a good question. I have, um, was literally thinking about that last night. And here's, the, here's some of the numbers I ran. Um, right now, at the national level, there are state public health laboratories have the capacity to run approximately 3,900 tests per day. That's as of last night. Maine can do about 200 per day. So on a percentage basis of all state public health laboratories, I'm not talking about Quest, not talking about universities, we're able to do about 5%, or sorry, about, yeah, about 5% of all the coronavirus tests that are done in the United States can be done here, which to me is great because we have about 0.4% of the population of the United States out of, you know, out of 330 million. So we are actually able to do about 10 times as many tests as we have on a per capita basis in the, in the population. That's a reassuring thing. It suggests that to the extent that providers are seeing these upticks in influenza and thinking it might not be influenza but maybe coronavirus, we have the capacity on a per capita basis. Again, we can do about 200, 3,900 tests in total, and on a per capita basis, we account for about 0.4%, but we can do about 5% of all the tests. So I can go through those numbers again. So that's a reassuring thing. But of course, in situations like this, one of the goals of public health is, I hate to use this term, but it's appropriate here, we've got to be able to think about the unknown unknowns as well as the known unknowns. So could there be the possibility out there that this is occurring? It's impossible to speculate. But what we do know is that providers are very clued into this. We've seen an increasing number of tests as the US CDC has liberalized their guidelines just in the past uh, 72 hours. Let me give you a couple of numbers. In terms of the number of phone calls that we receive to our hotline from clinicians, all right, that just over the past weekend, we received 80 phone calls specific to coronavirus. Just yesterday, we saw 119. So we went from about 40 a day on the weekend to about 119 yesterday. That's a significant uptick just in the past couple of days because all told, since we activated our activation, we've received 829 consults. So just in the past day, we've received over 13% of all the phone calls we've received in 24 hours. To me, that suggests that providers are clued in, they're thinking about coronavirus, they're calling to ask our epidemiologists and doctors for advice, and thus we have an outsized testing capacity relative to our population. So that's how I think about this. To me, it, great, it gives me comfort that our doctors out there are educated and they're ready to test. So happy to go through those numbers again if anyone wants, but quite literally, that is what I was thinking about last night. Okay, that's okay great. Thank you all very much. Okay.